So you, you need other strategies. Um, so you said that any, any network that has the same inputs and outputs can essentially be cool with the same kind of information. Yes. Thing, but it's that's just going to be like almost like a bias. So if I want to upload an image and have Google classify it for me, I'm not going to know that. So something about their API has got to not involve me knowing the key. So, but I can still run this algorithm. So, yeah, I'm not sure that fixes the problem. Go ahead, up here. Is it an acceptable perturbation? Because it seems like I can give, I can completely change the image and make them all fail, but like. It can only change it so much, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're right. I don't know how big the perturbations were here. Most researchers are careful about this, though. And everyone, of course, of course we could change images arbitrarily large. Everyone's interested in the case where the, the perturbations are essentially imperceptible. And I assume, although I guess I'm not sure, but I assume that's what they did here. So I, I assume it's probably imperceptible. We'd have to look at the paper to make sure. Yeah, so maybe you're saying like, well, well, maybe during training, what we should do is build a buffer around images. Yeah, like so to make sure that everything within a epsilon ball of that image. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, I don't, I don't know if people have done that, and I'm not sure how you would enforce that as a constraint. Uh, we'll we'll see one thing called distillation, which seems to help, and we'll see one thing called gradient masking, which feels a lot like their idea, which didn't help. <laughs> So it seems like most of this perturbations are in the digital space. Yeah. And if it is a concern for like an autonomous car, you have to get between the camera lens and the computer, whereas slapping a sticker on a stop sign is in the analog world. And that's not really a digital noise addition to this image. Where it's, you can't really alter their image they took with their camera and their computer in, the, in this digital space. In the analog world, you have to put like a, you have to like scan their camera sensor with a laser or something to say add noise. Does that make sense? Well, we can add a sticker that is mostly transparent. So, I mean, yes, we have to like somehow. So, I don't think anybody's actually worried about stickers on stop signs. I think people are interested, like, because this feels like this is teaching us something about how these neural nets work, and all these all these results are saying. Something about the decision boundaries of these things are remarkably fragile in a way that humans aren't. And why is that? And how can we improve it? I think that's what, that's why we actually care about it. I don't know, maybe sticker terrorism. You talked about like the idea yeah, was raised earlier about going back and, and doing some yeah. training cycle interpretation as part of your training data, mm -hmm. and therefore you account for it. You said that doesn't work. I just want to make sure I understand why that doesn't work. Right. So it's not that the perturbation is somehow to be learned, it's just that even if I figure one out, someone could just take the adversarial network and find another one? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, right, so there's some decision boundary, and we were here, and you found in your training set, you said, oh, okay, great, I'll find a perturbation here, and so I'm going to train on this, and so, okay, so we're going to fix that. But then the next guy comes along and says, oh, well, I'm just going to perturb right over here. And you're like, well, okay, I'm going to fix that. And the next guy's going to say, okay, I'm just going to perturb over to here. But there's, the problem is there's like a million dimension, like there's an, essentially an infinite number of directions you can go, and in some direction, the decision boundary is really close. Gotcha. That's the problem. Thank you. So, I'm for a while. Was the thought this, are these nets trained on the same data set? It's probably doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, um, wow, we're almost out of time. I'll show you one other variant of this single pixel perturbations.
<laughs> so you don't even have to have a, a whole image. Um, so the idea here is you're, you know, you're at some point in some high dimensional space, and I'm going to let you move just in one axis aligned dimension, right? So there's, um, but it turns out that if you pick just the right pixel and like jack it all the way up, uh, so this force, because you change that pixel, gets classified as an automobile. Clearly. Clearly. So this is not as, um, That's just embarrassing. Uh, this is not quite as, I think the fooling rates are not quite as strong with this as you can get if you're allowed to modify all the pixels. But the point is, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> of course, you have to pick like just the right pixel, right? But um, the point is, like, even a one pixel perturbation is enough to fool them. So, I don't know if you're going to cover this, but do you think this is like a layer level representation problem? Like, the way we're, we're getting these features from convolutions and these things, do you think? Or like an architecture problem, or is it like a loss function problem where we're not training them in the right way to maybe like create these distributions in a way that matches human performance? Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it like a fundamental a architecture question. problem that someone just has to come up with like the way our brain architecture do the same things? Or so the fact that it's robust across architectures and even across, like I said, there's been these results about fool other kinds of algorithms using the same kinds of perturbations. Yeah. That to me suggests something about our training is not right. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I really like sort of Marissa's idea where, yeah, it feels like it feels like what should happen is you should have an image, panda space, and there ought to be this this gap between panda space and given space. There's like this no man's land, and sure, you can perturb and perturb and perturb and perturb and perturb, and eventually it's just going to look uninterpretable. At which point, my classifier is going to say, I don't know. And then you have to go through this no man's land of weirdness until you finally get to given space. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a given, right? That's like, and it feels like that is like a DMZ or something between these two <laughs> classes. And, and somehow these things don't have that. But it feels like we do. And so I, I chalk that up to the like, training. There's nothing in our loss function that encourages a DMZ. That's vibes. Yeah. Uh, but somehow, if we had that, I think this would go away. So, all right, I guess we're done. So we'll talk about this a little bit more on Friday. Have a great week.